Hello, <laughs> good afternoon and welcome back to the Tech 23 Impact Circles. My name is Adina and for those new to the circles, welcome. Thank you for those who are rejoining them as well today, which is very exciting for today's conversation on a crucial topic, saving the planet with data, environmental intelligence. As is custom, I would first like to acknowledge both the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Bunwarung and Woiwurrung Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where the Slattery's team meets, works and creates. We pay our respects to elders both past, present and emerging. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Today's conversation will be kindly be led by Mike Zimmerman, and he's joined by Juliet Bell, Dr. Christoph Bergmeier, Sue Close, Aud Vignel, and Dr. Rob Waterworth. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, I'd like to make a special shout out to the Tech 23 sponsors, Transport for New South Wales, Main Sequence Syro Innovation Fund, Oz Industry Entrepreneurs Program delivered in partnership with i4 Connect, Addison's, ASX, and Stowe, Curtin University, Cicada Innovations and Evoke AG for helping to make Tech 23 happen. Hi, Rachel. Nice to see you here. Oh, hello, Edina, and hello, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you too, and especially uh, call out our contributors who are helping to make uh, these Tech 23 circles happen. Now in its 13th year, Tech 23 takes pride in celebrating Australian innovation and is all about amplifying the people and the organisations chipping away at the biggest challenges we face. Thank you to all of you who are Zooming in for being part of it. Please take the opportunity to say hello and introduce yourselves in the chat and uh, how you come to be on this Zoom. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions there as well. The link to Slattery's Charter will be found in the chat. This is a guide to the behaviour that we encourage at all of our events. There are lots more Tech 23 circles planned for 21, and there's lots of recordings on the website. Uh, please note that today's circle will be recorded. Just confirming, we will eavesdrop on the conversation and then move to Q&A, where you are welcome to come off mute and connect and chat. And for now, I am just honoured and grateful to hand off over to Mike uh, to kick things off. Hi, Mike. Hello, Rachel. Thanks, thanks for having us. Um, hi, everyone. Great to have you here. I'm Mike Zimmerman from Main Sequence hi, Managers. Hi. Hi. And uh, if everyone if everyone can mute, if you're not, thanks, Mike. And uh, we look forward to a very special conversation. Um, just a reminder, Main Sequence is a venture fund that was established in partnership with CSRO to help tackle some of the world's great challenges and certainly very, very keen to learn more about saving the planet with data um, and developing more environmental intelligence. And speaking of intelligence, we do have a lot of intelligence on our panel today. So we're just gonna do a quick whip around with, uh, with introductions to help everyone in the framing um, before we kick off. So Juliet, you're next to me in the uh, in our Brady Bunch panel. So I'll just flip it over to you. Thanks, Mike and Slattery's colleagues. Um, my name is Juliet Bell. I'm the lead of CSIRO's Climate Resilient Enterprise Mission, which is about empowering the private sector to um, respond to the challenges of a changing climate. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Juliet. And Rob, you're next to Juliet. So you're up next. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Waterworth, uh, CEO of the Mullion Group, and we work specifically in integrating all types of different data from satellites to ground data to models uh, to bring impact into the environment in the land sector. Terrific. Sue, you're up next. Sure. So my name is Sue Close, um, and I'm a company director. I'm on a few boards. Um, a couple of them are quite relevant for today's discussion. The first is um, EnviroSuite, and um, the second one is NearMap. Both are active in environmental data and also location-specific data. Terrific. Thank you, Sue. Aud, you're next. Thanks, Mike. I'm Aude Vignel. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at the Australian Space Agency. Our role uh, in the team is to deliver on the civil space strategy. So we are delivering roadmap 
Uh, we delivered the first one communication roadmap uh, last year. And this year we are delivering the remaining and the next to come is Earth observation from space with a lot of data. So good timing to have this conversation. Thank you. Fantastic. And last but definitely not least, uh, Christophe. Hello, I'm Christoph Berg, my researcher in data science and AI at Monash Uni. Uh, I mostly work in forecasting and for today's talk, the relevant parts are like renewable energy forecasting and electricity, sustainable electricity forecasting. Hey, terrific. So as you can see, a uh, fantastic group of, of experts and, and opinion leaders to draw from and we'll bring you into the conversation as well. First, we'll do that with some, um, we'll, we'll start off with some topics that we've kind of preloaded, but we'd love to also have your questions in the chat. And then finally, we'll, we'll open up to more live um, Q&A towards the end of our, uh, our first 45 minutes. So we were gonna start with just some framing and I think Rob, you were gonna kick it off. We wanted to just frame up what is environmental data, what's the context and kind of landscape we're looking at and how did it originate? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, look, it's a really interesting topic, I think, because when we look at environmental data, I typically go back to thinking how it largely started with governments, and I often think mainly about weather data, and the weather data uh, industry is a great example, starting from governments collecting a lot of data, governments putting early satellites up, um, then private sector and others starting to use that data and actually integrate that with their own systems and forming this really interesting ecosystem of public and private that both feed off each other really heavily. And that then comes into these, it also is nice because it covers the types of data you get. It gets everything from ground data, from weather stations, satellites, and all the modeling systems you need to both interpolate that data, but also predict out to give you useful information around, you know, is there going to be a massive storm? So, you know, starting from that level, you can come back many others uh, just other areas of the environment. Yeah, terrific. Anybody else want to add any context? Um, I'm happy to. That, Julia? Yeah. Um, I, th I think historically there's been a real split between state and federal government and, and data collection, depending on their various responsibilities, and then this emerging swathe of data collection points from the private sector, which are really rich. So Australia is a big country full of farms and mines and lots of other bits of kit um, and infrastructure. They've actually been collecting data in a fairly rigorous way for many decades. And the value now is, is in coupling that private sector and public sector data to fill in those geospatial gaps. Um, and why do we care about the geospatial gaps? Because that's what makes us vulnerable as a nation, um, having gaps in our environmental intelligence, because it means it's harder to understand what's going to happen in the future. I think the other frontier that we're moving towards is coupling better geophysical, um, biogeophysical data and socioeconomic data to actually build these models that, that are far more predictive and far more valuable and relevant. Mm. Terrific. Okay. Um, well, I mean, that leads me to uh, nicely into, into sort of the second topic we're going to touch on where we dive into to kind of value propositions and you know, who is it that is getting the value out of the environmental data? So some of what you explained there, it sounded like the government was maybe getting the most value out of it, but I know things are changing a bit with some emerging um, kind of requirements and regulations. So that's that's quite an open, open question, but is the data mostly just valuable to, you know, at kind of a macro level in terms of governments, and maybe you know large financial institutions looking at trends or weather risk or you know are, are there other people now getting getting a lot more value? Maybe we can just I'm sure we'll have a lot of examples of that. Feel free to jump in, Sue. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll jump in um, because I live in a very different world. I think because I'm primarily coming at this from the perspective of um, two private or two companies um, that create um, SaaS products to help operators get value from the data. Um, there's the macro level data or the, the big picture data that I think most of the panel um, spends their time on and I won't even pretend to understand um, all of that. However, there's a different um, type of environmental data or I'd say data with great environmental benefits that is captured on a much more local level. 
um, potentially. So, you know, for example, Nearmap puts planes in the air, takes millions of photos, stitches them together, and then that becomes a data source, very rich location data, not just images, but also um, data extracted from that. In Virus Suite, um, works with operators to put very complex systems of monitors on the ground to help mines, for example, stay on top of emissions. Um, I think that's also environmental data, and maybe I twisted the definition so that my, my world fits in it, um, but I think that's also environmental data or data with great environmental impact. And in that case, um, maybe I'm, I'm again biased because I'm, I'm quite positive on both of these companies. I think there's a huge number of um, parties that benefit. So this wouldn't be a business if the companies didn't benefit. And I think that's right. one of the realities here. If it's not good business, it's going to be hard to get this going. Um, but those mine sites benefit, the airports benefit, um, you know, the wastewater facilities benefit. They run their businesses better. They stay out of trouble. They, they fulfill compliance obligations. But increasingly, and, you know, as a company director, I'm very aware of um, the need for everyone to have environmental policies and strategies. Um, in, investors care. Um, so I think there's, there's very broad benefits. Communities care, employees care about operating well and not doing harm. Um, so in a very tactical on the ground sense, there's, there's loads of beneficiaries. Mm. I if I can... Yeah, oh, sorry, you go. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to add a, a few things. Um, I think working for the Australian Space Agency, I have to say government is, is an anchor customer for environmental data. And what you will probably see in the, in the roadmap here, what we are trying to see, there is a lot of data available. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, I think we have not yet seen everything we're going to be able to unlock with all the data that is uh, available. Um, I, I often compare, you know, when you look at GPS, GPS was first done for, for government and now look at all the commercial um, benefits we are, we are unlocking with uh, GPS data. We went through the uh, GPS revolution and I think with the environmental data, we're going to see the same thing. They're going to be a, a big revolution with all this data that, that, we, uh, that we have. What I wanted also to say is um, when you mention meteorological data, so government is a customer, uh, environmental data government is an anchor customer. And what we are looking at in, uh, in the agencies, what kind of data we're missing for Australia, Aust Australia's specific case. When we think of environmental, we think about disaster, bushfires, floods, um, and any other disaster we can unfortunately think of. Um, and there are things we would like to observe from space that are different to, to other countries. Uh, I often say, you know, when we, we want to be prepared as much as we can for the bushfire seasons we are looking into the the load of fuel um, and mm. this can be leaves in australia eucalyptus eucalyptus leaves in other countries there'll be different type of trees uh, so we we need different type of data and different type of sensors to look into uh, in, into this fuel load that are typical to uh, to australia um so it, Interesting, so uh, everything you say, I think I, I echo everything you say, but uh, often the government start to be the anchor customer and then and then the private uh, mm. companies uh, follow on. Mm. Mm. Great, and Christoph, you're, yeah. you're using data and helping others use data at a more micro level versus sort of macro, if I get it. Yeah, and exactly, and actually, I, I think that's uh, an example that fits in here very well as well, because um, if you want to do like, um, renewable energy forecasting, right? Like solar power generation, wind power generation forecasting. You, you need a good weather forecast as well uh, as the base for that. So I think that's a, a typical example where the government or whoever produces like a, a good weather forecast and then you, you try to, to um, use that for your particular application in a certain way, right? And, and I think the weather forecast is one such governmental service that we now use in many different ways to create value and but I, I think like the weather data weather forecasts that doesn't have to be the only one we could come up with other such systems uh, that could then also be leveraged in, in the micro mm -hmm. level. I wondered how um, I wondered you know I tend to think of environmental data as as more something where we might be reporting out or monitoring um, for whether it's for emissions or like bushfire loads but I wondered about um, the actionability of the data and how it's being op operationalized so can anyone give us some examples of that 
um, how stuff is being, how, how the data is being turned into action. Yeah, look, um, I mean, I can, I can jump in from the outside if you like, from the, sorry, Juliet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry. I mean, I mean, this is, this is one of the key things is it's all very good and well knowing what's happening and what's happened in the past, but you actually have to have systems that can be predictive into the future to say, well, if you take these actions, here will be the implications of those. And I think this is exactly why, uh, and Christoph and everyone else has largely mentioned this, is this is why you need multiple streams of data being integrated because there isn't one stream of environmental data that can do that. You can't do it with all the satellites, you can't do it with models, and you can't do it with ground data. The question is, how do you pull it together? Because one of the big challenges we've seen in the land sector space, for example, uh, is people who do build separate systems for those and you get these lovely discontinuities of reporting along at a number and then we move to our projection system and the number starts up here and does this. And so you're not actually getting a clear signal as to, well, is it changing because of your data and your models or is it changing because you've done something? And this is a really interesting challenge in this space going forward. Mm -hmm. Got it, great. Um, Juliet, yeah, sure. yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's I think that is a good point. Um, the constraining factors that we found, and was we were building up our mission um, for climate resilient enterprises, we went out and spoke to about 150 C-suite executives, and they gave us very blunt feedback. There's too much data. Um, we don't have the right analytics to process it. It's not clear about the uncertainty. The uncertainty ends up feeling like we're doing meaningless things. So how do you construct scenarios? that are grounded in truth, but they're still scenarios. So how do you couple, for instance, um, climate with catastrophic loss models from tro potential tropical cyclone tracks? And this is where the data gets really complex because you've got to be clear about what Rob was just um, touching on there, attribution, contribution. Um, as I said before, coupling biogeophysical data with socioeconomic data, so it is usable. What's the value at risk? Is that tropical cyclone track potentially 25 years down the track plows through the shopping centre you've invested in? So it's about making the data meaningful from a geospatial perspective, from an asset perspective, and from an uncertainty perspective. Mm -hmm. And is that mostly, in, in, sorry, in that case, Julie, just kind of double clicking there a little bit. Is that mostly from like a financial services uh, insurance point of view or are there other kind of interested parties in that data? Um, the financial services sector is really a unifying force for the economy and that's one of the reasons why we focused on them. So I think most people on the call will be aware of the regulatory changes that are coming around climate disclosure. When the big five banks in Australia um, are subjected to the climate vulnerability assessment that APRA is putting together, they will very quickly turn to their top customers. Those top customers will very quickly turn to their customers and supply chains. So what we think of as being exclusively the domain of the financial services sector and insurers rapidly becomes everybody's problem because of that knock-on effect. So we all need to take an interest in environmental intelligence and take a little bit more of a control of our own destiny in terms of the kind of data we use and the way we use that data to make decisions about our future. Yeah whether it's your superannuation or, or banking choices or insurance or personal investments. Is the, sorry, this will be my last one there, we'll, we'll go off to, to others, sorry, but just the implication there being that um, under the regulation or, and with that risk assessment being done, someone might choose to make different lending decisions. So someone's availability of, of ability to get capital to make an investment in a new develop, real estate development or vineyard or whatever it is might actually be impacted from this data. So that's, yeah, that, that's pretty tangible and impactful down at the, yes. you know, at the individual business level. Yes. Yeah, on. If I can just uh, add to this and to what Rob was saying as well, like, um, what kind of data do we do we need or, or how, how usable is the data you, you asked? And to me, it's really an end-to-end -end value chain, you know, from, from collecting the data, aggregating the data, trusting, ensuring the data, um, analyzing the data, and then rendering the data. There is all these steps. Um, mm. And I invite you, there was um, a bushfire report that we um, published for our then minister about the, how, how 
earth observation data from space can help bushfire uh, management before, during, and after. Uh, and we try to explain all this stage there. Uh, so it's important that this chain is, uh, is well understood. Um, and I also need to highlight, Australia doesn't have earth observation uh, satellites in space. But we've been using and we've had access to space data for 40 years. So all the Landsat data, Sentinel, Copernicus data, we've been given access to this. And there is this great community in EO data in space. And we've been analyzing and using this data. And they are made available, by the way, to anyone who wants to use. And they're often challenged that are being uh, organized. Like, here is all this data. Whoever wants to, to do an application with it, there are some challenges being organized. And uh, we're, we're always amazed about the uh, ingenuity and creativity and, and innovation that uh, stakeholders in Australia mm. have. So Australia needs to be praised for their ability to, to use the data because we have access to them for, for the last 40 years. And, and this is something that, uh, wor worth bragging about. Mm. That's terrific. Sue, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I was, and maybe this gets to some of the topics I know that, that you may want to put out um, following this. Um, I think that there's data, then there's um, the systems that contain it. I think something else that's emerging as all of these sectors emerge or, or mature is um, it's like any software business. It has to be a product. It has to be productized. It has to be usable. And it has to be designed with the customer needs in mind. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the advances have come from. You know, we're, we're all sort of drowning in data, but if the data doesn't sit somewhere where we can access it and do something with it, then um, we're gonna have a hard time getting the benefit of it. I think particularly, I mean, I think it was Odd who said, you know, often the government's the, the anchor customer, and then it goes to some of the very sophisticated customers. Um, but if we're gonna democratize this and get it in the hands of broad stakeholders, businesses, governments, councils, um, users like that, it's got to become really um, just dead easy to get your hands on mm -hmm. and, and use. And I think we're, we're starting to make some good progress in Australia in, in that technology moving forward. Is, is there anything would you say or would anybody else say about the current world that we're in? I was going to say the current environment, but the current world, anything about now, like we often say on, our, in, on the investment side is why now? Why is now uh, the right time to be doing this? Um, it sounds like the regulation is one thing, APRA, with that coming in, but there's some other things around productizing, like the, you know, compute capabilities or cloud, or, you know, maybe it's the EO data that were the new EO data we're getting access to, things like that. Is there, does anyone want to comment on kind of why now? What are you, what are you saying, Rob? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think a lot of this is um, compute and actually um, things coming out into a, a true operational framework. So if I was to look at the sort of history of, say, forest cover mapping around the world, if you type forest cover mapping into Google, you'll find about 50,000 groups all claiming they can do it. There's really only about four or five companies in the entire world now who can actually do it in an operational sense. And that's a really interesting space that's only opened up in the last couple of years. Traditionally, if you wanted to get that data, you'd contact a university or a research agency, you'd wait a year, you'd get a time series, you'd do it. Now, Australia led the world in that, to be frank, in, in the early 2000s. Australia was the absolute world leader in forest cover mapping at continental scales. But the interesting part of that is that the companies we work with um, to bring data into our systems are all largely overseas now. And the reason they've been empowered is because Amazon loaded the Landsat data up. And suddenly they can do a lot of work that they couldn't do before. And instead of waiting a year, we can ask for data over any country in the world and we can have products in a month. And that's mm. amazing. Mm. And so is the, is the implication with, with some of that, that there's this publicly available data and then you basically, if you're a commercial enterprise, you, commercial enterprise, you got to figure out a way to add value to what's out there. It's not necessarily proprietary data, but the way you package it up, your algorithms um, and kind of tailoring the data to the needs of the customer is the way you're making money out of it. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely how we see it. It's how do you take it and actually put it together in a coherent manner is, is really the secret. Yeah. So how do you guys, I mean, we've got several commercial entities here uh, and, and maybe one in the making in the, in the climate mission, but um, I wondered how you guys think about charging 
customers and what the ROI for them is, because it seems to me it's quite the little, little bit of an obscure ROI. It's so do you want to? I'd say it, 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 there's so many different um, scenarios. Um, it is and it isn't. Um, it, it's sometimes you have to break it down to quite simplistic factors, at least to get, get this started. Um, for example, I look at the early days in Nearmap, and we would just talk about how you could avoid site visits, avoid getting in the truck to make it that basic. Mm -hmm. If you have environmental data that allows you to do planning, um, you know, combining all the different layers of data um, remotely. Um, and that sort of sold the product. To be honest though, it wasn't so much ROI is they just would look at it and just sort of get it. There's a bit of a cool factor that they would just know that it was gonna be, um, it was gonna allow them to do things they couldn't even do today. Mm -hmm. um, with EnviroSuite, I think it, it came out of more compliance. Um, you know, that's the heritage. You, you simply had to do this. You know, an airport does have to be able to track noise um, to handle noise complaints. There's just no way around that. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, if, if you don't have a system to do it, I honestly don't know what the alternative was. Um, but what we hope and what we do, you know, have pl plenty of evidence from now is they get the systems and as their usage becomes more sophisticated, they're just able to make decisions or see things they couldn't see before. You know, they mm -hmm. can do predictive modeling combining, for example, weather data and potential scenarios for dust or odor mm -hmm. and avoid problems. You know, they might do an ROI, but it's also just, it becomes a bit of a no-brainer. How could you operate without this? Great. Um, I, I was going to bring up um, climate. Uh, so we talked about saving the planet, but, um, you know, climate and greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases. Um, and everyone talks about carbon markets coming. We've got... Uh, you know, various, various states of carbon markets all over the world. And I wondered if someone could pick up how this data plays into enabling carbon markets. Yeah, I can jump in there since that's obviously what we work in fairly heavily. <laughs> um, you know, from the land sector, it's obviously pivotal. The, the big challenge has always been is that it's um, you know, obviously the land sector spread over all the land uh, it's not a nice point source like a, a coal-fired power station or something like that uh, and you've got all of these multiple challenges around the land it's reacting to climate it's reacting to management it's got large legacy impacts and there's a huge range of complex policy and reporting rules that sit over the top mm. that actually makes it considerably more difficult to get good estimates out than just saying we burnt a ton of coal and a ton of coal, coal equals x ton of uh, CO2. So to me, this is really where these big scale remote sensing programs come, come into their own. And again, I'll come back to say the, the building of Australia's NCAS back in the early 2000s, which was the very first annual time series continental coverage Landsat product in the world um, mm. and continued to be for 15 years. So, um, and that was there specifically to solve that problem. How do you support markets by providing data that can be support the measurement do automated reporting and then also automate the verification processes because costs are a huge factor here. And if you don't get costs mm -hmm. down, you're not going to get markets. That's I, from the land side. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, I think that's a really important um, you know, aspect that unless you're kind of inside the sector, you don't realize that the kind of scalable cost-effective measurement and verification is a critical part of of opening up any of these these markets, and if you have to send people out to do intensive, you know, land studies and and you know buy buy uh, various sensors and stick them in the ground and things like that, it's going to erode your you know dollars per ton of whatever you're you're trying to um, you know and send people to save. So it is really a critical thing, and and I think it's a um, a huge opportunity for environmental data. Um, I wondered, maybe just shift to the government's role and then maybe talk about the research um, ecosystem because we have Juliet and Christoph here um, and Odd, uh, frankly, working on the, the research side of things is um, what are the types of innovations? What's the new, what's the new, what are the new things that the research community is working on? I'm happy to jump in first. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> 
I, I think just before I answer that, what why is government doing this? So, so CSRO has a, a special role in the Australian innovation system to not just to innovate, but to create new industry and support industries as they transition. So we want to make sure that that rather than climate intelligence, climate research, research around how much soil, um, how, how much carbon soils in Australia can can absorb to support a carbon market, um, we want to make sure that it's accurate and it's contextualised to Australian conditions and therefore it helps Australia win in this space. Um, so we want to create new industry and there's been billions of dollars of investment in all sorts of funky climate analytics but they're stuck on the shelf. So what we're doing with Microsoft is building an environment that democratises access to that, lowers the barrier to entry and participation in being able to dial up the API or analytics that you need to solve your particular problem, or mentioned it earlier, along the end-to-end -end value chain of, of climate need, whether it's hazard, the impact of that hazard, all the way through to some wicked transition problem for your scope three supply chain responsibilities. Um, so I think that what, what's happening in government research at the moment is a massive integration exercise and a massive mm. private sector outreach exercise, which should be unlocking billions of dollars of previous investment in research and, and making it far more usable and actionable. Um, yeah. I think that's really exciting. We can only do that with entities like Microsoft. Also, the AI um, and the ability to accelerate the way in which people access and use um, incredibly complex analytics um, and incredibly complex levels of uncertainty and derive meaning from that. So it's, it's AI-enabled innovation. Mm. I think that's the change. Mm. Uh, if I may yeah. echo everything Juliet just said um, and at the, the beginning of the value chain, which is the sensor, it's clear that um, to have an, an even better picture of what's happening on, on Earth and that also we uh, answer the question of why now and why climate, and you mentioned climate as well. I think this is why we need so much data it's with this data that you see that there is a climate challenge that we need to address, right? Without that, we wouldn't. We, I don't think we would realize that badly how, how mm. um, there is an urgency there. Um, the research we see crucial is what kind of sensor we can develop. Um, so we, we can take all the optical picture that you want, but hyperspectral is also something that is becoming mm. very interesting. Um, instead of sending a sensor in space with just one particular spectrum, we have now sensors that are hyperspectral, so you can change as you go the spectrum you want to observe your data, and you can do that with AI on board. Like, no, this is not the right spectrum, I'm changing, I'm taking another um, uh, capture, and, and you see if it's what, what you need. Um, and there is also another thing that CSR is actually leading, they've purchased 10% on the NovaSAR satellite, so it's mm -hmm. a synthetic aperture radar, so with radar you go night clouds you go through all this and um, mm. that's quite new and and we're very excited to have access to all this data to see what kind of information we, we can get and we found that with this sound data you can see the burn scar very well so you you know where to send uh, people to uh, regenerate the the, the bush um, mm. uh, vegetation in in, uh, in in urgency so there is a lot again along the whole um, value chain there is innovation all along the way and the mm. uh, but the sen I'm quite passionate about the sensor side of things and, and we are doing some exciting things on that. Odd, Odd, can you say more about the hyperspectral? What's, um, just for, for people like myself or other lay people, what is visible through a hyperspectral sensor that you can't otherwise see? So you won't you won't see this, uh, on a hyperspectral depending of the bands there are things you mm -hmm. you I cannot see but it's a different signature of, of emission so that's what I was referring to with the optical the, optical. the leaves the mm -hmm. eucalyptus leaves they will have a different signature than a, than a pine leaves for example so different bands in the spectrum of of emissions that you need to look at to be able to identify what what you are after. Mm -hmm. So depending of what you are looking for, you will use a, a low frequency band or a high frequency band in the spectrum mm -hmm. to be able to see in infrared or or in uh, the warm uh, red or, or the green, different depending mm -hmm. of what you want to look at. So you, you can adapt your your um, mm -hmm. visibility of what where you want to see. 
Got it. And probably level of moisture in both the ground or maybe in the, the leaves as well. So you talked about fuel load. Yes, you will also be able to see the kind of, of water. And there's again a mission from a, that CSR is looking at called Aqua Watch that is also looking specifically having an hyperspectral sensor to look at the contamination of water on the surface. So you can see this kind of information as well on, on water and, and moisture. Mm, mm, mm. And, and I think yeah. the, the key thing on that is, as I said before, you had to decide which band you wanted to look at. Mm. Now you can have an instrument that can do all these bands because of the technology. It's like the satellites, they were 10 meter high and five tons before, and now they are a loaf of bread because of the rapid development of technology. You can miniaturize your, uh, your technology and, and do more with less. Mm. Amazing. Christophe? Yeah, I'm, I mean, well, the question was, what are universities doing, right? But, but also going, again, back a bit more broadly to this, why is all of this now happening? I mean, obviously, this environmental intelligence is part of just a bigger AI transformation in, in many industries, right? And I think a lot of the things we, are, we see happening is that just now we, we have all the tools, right? So on the one hand, we have the capacity to store these data sets, but we are also now like also the algorithms, they, they are a lot more just kind of ready to use and, and now in, in the cloud. So not only um, is the data there, but it's now just um, a lot easier to, to analyze that type of data and we have the algorithm and the tools. And, and I think that also transform, transforms a bit the, the research at, at universities, right? So in the sense that, um, I, I mean, obviously we have this kind of, the hardcore of just machine learning research, statistics, and so on, which is more maybe more what I do, but obviously also in, in a lot of more applied fields, mm. uh, we now um, rely much more on data. Or, or well, I, I mean, research always has to, I mean, always has relied on data uh, in mm. a certain degree. But I think we, yeah, we, we see that much more that it's just more systematized, bigger data sets, more. Um, more compute power so that many fields that before have not used these uh, techniques, they are now just starting to use these techniques. So uh, from a university point of view, it's really just that before, if you did machine learning, you were in a computer science department, but now you could be sitting in pretty much any department applying these methods. Mm. Folks, we have, um, I think we're going to do a couple more, maybe one or two minutes more just on some of the prepared stuff. And so if you have other questions um, you want to put into the chat or we'll can do some live kind of comments and questions after this for the last five minutes, we are going to try and wrap this portion um, of our, our panel at about a quarter to, so in about seven or eight minutes. I guess the, the last question I had is quite a, Quite a general one, which is what are the big unlocks we still need? Where are the big issues, or what's our what are some of the limiting factors that you're seeing for us really being able to get value out of the data to help us save the planet? Um, maybe just do a bit of a round robin. Anybody has a strong opinion? Uh, what would you love to see more of? I'll jump in. I'll, I'd say release of data um, and access and improved licensing. I, I think from a government perspective, that's ab absolutely pivotal. So the, the two examples I think of from an environmental perspective would be the Medea program. If you, for those of you who are, like their history of remote sensing programs, it's worth looking up. But, you know, that unlocked, that was a, a system set up in the 80s and 90s by the US to unlock the spy satellite data out of the CIA mm. and the KGB. And that, that revolutionized our view back into the 50s of what we were seeing across the environment. Amazing, amazing process to do that. Um, and you can think about the same thing with Landsat. You know, Landsat's great, it's been up there forever. There's a huge thing of it, but it really only started to go when they opened the archive for free in 2008. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's those government processes and those that democratize that data has been pointed out before and make it available that then spurs the entire market. Mm -hmm. Sue, from your commercial perspective, any any big limitations you're seeing or what's holding your 
yeah. kind of markets back? I think um, it was actually a piece of research done by Envirosuite right around when I joined last year. Um, and you could almost split the market of potential users into thirds. There's a third that get it and are already on board. That's great. There's a third that have good intentions, you know, and we chase them. It's kind of where our market is. But then there's probably a third who just are are not there yet. And I think there is still a, a misperception that this is harder than it really is or not as useful as it really is or somehow just it's not here yet. And it's actually far more real and actionable. So, you know, it gets back to, you know, what do we do? We, we just constantly try and educate and get the word out. Um, but that's a gating factor too often. I, I, I think the, um, you know, incoming APRA and other regulations that you're seeing, not only in Australia, but in Europe, right, as well. Yep. I think Europe tend, tends to lead on some of this. Yeah. Um, and that's really, why sometimes it's it's a good thing that, yeah. that regulation in government right. you know does force this and it, it educates people and it makes them get on board. So you know it is happening. It's just frustratingly slow sometimes. Yeah, consultants make a lot of money in the meantime, but then at some point there's some some products being developed and uh, more automated, cost-effective solutions. Mm -hmm. We get there in the end. Um, any other comments on unlocks or challenges? And then maybe we'll just get a couple of questions. Just a quick comment on Rob, the, all the Earth observation data from Landsat and Sentinel are accessible to anyone and have been for a while. And, and that's the interesting things about government being the customer. If, if we, the government, buy commercial data from Planet, for example, the agreement we have in the contract in buying this data is going to be very complex because if we want to make this data available to everyone, not only Australian, but sharing them with, uh, with our uh, allies, that's what the complication is. So it's interesting today that for us observation, there is a great um, rationale as to why it should be a government asset because we can share the data not only with, with our stakeholders in Australia, but anywhere in the world. Commercial data is more complicated. I don't know how it is with other, other data on, on, on the ground and not on space because out of space, I don't know much, um, but it's an interesting, interesting um, factor to, to bring up, I think. Mm. Terrific. Um, so there is, I noticed the questions, a um, couple of questions here, one from Jess, if I've, I've got that right. Um, did the panelists have any plans to use environmental economic accounting as part of their data products? Oh, there we go. Hi, Jess. Have I got that right, Jess? Yeah. Okay. That's right. The, the developing system around natural capital accounting and environmental economic accounting, which is in you know national accounts um, right now. I can see Juliet's nodding there. But yeah, just wondering if that's starting to be a conversation. I know it's relatively new. And, and just some thinking about how you're doing that, if there's any examples. I'm happy to have a first go. Um, so whilst we're, we're focusing on um, building a very large climate intelligence marketplace that, that initially focuses on physical acute and chronic and transitional risks, um, you can't go very far down that path even in the next 12 months without beginning to couple it to natural capital accounting tools um, because that will be the next frontier that the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, pump out. You cannot effectively transition without demonstrating the efficacy of different technologies at better managing your natural capital accounts. Um, so we know that um, we're seeing some very, very large um, fast moving consumer goods ASX companies in, in Australia begin to invest in this space. And again, the private sector is probably leading the government here in, in this space. And, and, and we're filling that um, market failure gap and helping support them with the tools. I do think the low hanging fruit is around coupling some of the uh, you know, the products everybody's using, like Microsoft suite tools like Excel and so on. Um, one of my colleagues, Libby Pinkard, is, is developing excellent natural capital accounting tools that you can run in Excel. Eventually, that mm. will be packaged up and put into a more sophisticated, interoperable environment. But there's some really good kit out there now. Um, and if you're interested, I'm, I'm happy to put anyone in touch with colleagues in Syria who have some of these tools available. Sounds amazing. Thank you. And then last, maybe the last comment is uh, just about oceans, because we were talking a lot about land, but oceans, opportunity with oceans. Yeah, look, I'm not an oceans expert, but I, th I think that is a, that's a huge unexplored area. I mean, it's starting to come in when you look at the coastlines, obviously, 
um, mm. the descriptions into blue carbon and moving into um, teal carbon as they go, they keep changing the colours as we go along. But so you've got fascinating aspects there of, of what's going on in those biological systems, but then you've got all these really interesting issues starting to come up around what's the impact going to be of various um, ocean mm. temperature changes, for example, on climate predictions. Mm. And, you know, there's some amazing tech out there, not just from the satellite world, but sail drone and these other things that are, that are just um, really sort of leading the world in how do you collect this data remotely, given that oceans are not a simple thing to sample. So mm. I think that is a really big next frontier. Yeah, great. Um, and then, and then before we wrap, um, just for, for all the contributors, thank you very much for, for participating, uh, kind of more fiber, uh, formally. Um, is there any way that we can help you? What do you need from, from us, the audience, the public, um, anything you want us to get the word out on? Any wishes? Fair enough. Well, with that, um, I guess we're going to go to more informal. I'll take direction from yeah, Dina and Rachel. Yes, Where do you want to go so from much, here? Thank you so much, Mike, and contributors. That was really <laughs> a lot of food for thought, and I'm sure we have a lot more to discuss. Now we are going <laughs> to we're going to stop the formal. Um, part of this and we're going to pop into some smaller breakout rooms um, but if you can't stay please thank uh, take our thanks we appreciate it and we look forward to catching you next time thank you everyone mike thanks juliet thanks robert thanks odd thanks christoph thanks sue